Hello, everyone. Welcome to Avaya's Healthy Aging Curriculum. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are teachers, mentors, and the co-owners of Avaya University. Avaya is the creator of over a thousand books, films, courses, teachings, and other supportive resources. Thank you so much for being here. Our fellow teacher, Dr. Mark Emerson, is here today to talk with us about chronic inflammation, the wildfire of premature aging. Dr. Emerson is a chiropractic physician, author, and internationally recognized professional speaker who specializes in nutrition-based lifestyle medicine and natural treatment methods for pe people of all ages. His successful clinically proven protocols help to empower people to live healthier by preventing, reducing, and resolving chronic progressive health issues and diseases. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. The pleasure is mine. And I would love if we just dove right into this topic of, of inflammation. So how does chronic inflammation relate to premature aging? Well, premature aging is the key, right? When I hear a lot of, you know, the discussion is aging, but of course we're designed to age. Ideally, we're going to age. That yes. means we're around long enough to age, which is always a good thing. But really what we're looking at from a society standpoint is really premature aging. And I think it's important to realize that the majority of people, the majority of patients, uh, particularly in, in our country, the United States, are going to die of a chronic progressive disease. And that's just, that's flat out fact, right? We got cancers and cardiovascular disease and, you know, stroke and diabetes and all these chronic progressive diseases. And what that means is, is the chronicity is a slow moving kind of time bomb, right? that takes decades to get. You don't get a chronic progressive disease over a bad weekend in Vegas, um, just like you don't get premature aging over a bad weekend, you know, say in Hawaii in the sun too long. It's really a progressive, you know, slow insidious movement of how we get to premature. And then when do we notice? We're 40 years old and we kind of look like we've aged too much. Well, that's, that's that whole progression part of it. So I think the important thing for patients to understand about premature because we've had this this um, industry pop up called anti-aging which is to me just an oxymoron because um, it doesn't combat honestly in my opinion it doesn't combat the premature aging what it does is it throws a lot of smoke and mirrors at looking better but on the internal side where the aging is truly happening you're still you got a wildfire burning out and you're still premature aging so the chronic inflammation is foundational to premature aging because it's foundational to all breakdown of cellular tissue. And so if you think about all the diseases I just mentioned, they all have a foundational aspect of chronic inflammation to them. All of them, you know, and now we're looking at Alzheimer's dementia. <clears throat> this is in chronic inflammatory state of the arteries of the brain, the tissue of the brain, et cetera. So what we really want to do is we want to halt and reverse this premature aging, which means we're going to go after the chronic inflammatory response, right? And so that's um, that's really the key to kind of fixing most things that are that are chronic progressive, and, and aging is one of them. The premature aging is one of them. And if you think about it, <clears throat> we really live a fast-paced, stress-induced life, and it comes all the way down to our food supply, to our work habits, to not enough sleep. Right. And these are the things we always talk about with aging, right? So what, you know, anything is going to advance age. Think of your car. If you didn't take care of your car, you left it out in the rain, it got oxidized with rust, you didn't change the oil, it would then premature age. It looked like heck in a matter of five years, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the concepts that we really want to move. It's somewhat of a paradigm shift, but it all fits, fits together in the degenerative lifestyle that we've created. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And, and mm -hmm. isn't that true, right? We do live in such an interesting time and <clears throat> are doing so many things that are not, that are really against our bodies aging in a healthy way, because that's really what it's all about in my, in my experience. So so like what, I'd love to understand a little better and have our audience understand a little better, like this process of inflammation and chronic inflammation, like what is actually happening in the body to our cells when, you know, sure. we <clears throat> continuously do X or have this diet or this lifestyle, like how does it, what does it do to us? Right. And, and it really is a sequence of unfortunate events, as I like to to say because it's not one thing if it was one thing we could remove one thing and everything would be honky dory and that's the same thing with diet i get the you know we work with diet a lot with patients and they, they 
patients always seem to think, hey, if I just remove X, everything will get better. But it really doesn't happen that way because it, it becomes a, a, a pretty much a status of how you live, right? So your cell, cellular structure, your cell, cellular matrix that you live in is your body, is your body right? <clears throat> and obviously that that's, uh, has a lot of influences, external and internal. And so this chronic inflammation, this is what really happens. So inflammation is beneficial to the body. And, and we see acute inflammation all the time. When we get a little sprain of the wrist or a cut on the skin or whatever, these are uh, the way inflammation is designed. It's a very, very important part of our immune system. But it's really designed to be an acute transient, you know, short-term thing, right? Where there really isn't supposed to be a chronic stimulator of, Injury after injury after injury after injury, right? And so acute, <clears throat> excuse me, acute injury happens. It happens, the, the inflammatory phase is very transient. It fixes it and whoop, goes away. And now your tissue and your body or your systems is no longer in an inflammatory state. It goes on about normal homeostasis and balance. The problem with the chronic ailment, uh, <clears throat> chronic inflammation is the chronic inflammation is this re recurring acute injury over and over and over and over. So the body really never heals. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is chronic inflammation is actually destructive to the cells that are in the area. Right. So, for instance, if you if you had a sprained wrist and you just kept spraining it week after week after week, a year later, that wrist would become pretty much dysfunctional. Right. You would lose range of motion. This is where uh, disability ratings happen with, you know, us physicians, we rate disabilities. What we say is like, OK, that thing is trash pretty much forever. Right. And so what happens there is this, the system is gone, you know, or it's altered the tissue around. It's all now it has scar tissue. It just functionally doesn't work like it once did. And that's what we see internally, which promotes this premature aging, right? So the mechanisms of chronic inflammation is really there's a, a, a persistent reactive molecular breakdown, which means there's something causing it, right? Mm -hmm. Diet and lifestyle is the number one. It's foundational to it. And I'll talk about that, um, you know, towards the end of our talk, because I think it's, it's, it's the most important. But to understand the mechanisms, right? So what happens in a chronic inflammation is we get cellular structural change, which means our system starts to adapt to chronicity, this chronic inflammation. And from a chemical standpoint, because remember, we are a biochemical animal, our body will chemically change trying to deal with the chronic inflammation, right? The problem with that is it's now trying to be in a survival mode and no longer can be in that homeostasis growth mode growth and repair, flourish, right? Proper, proper immune system balance, right? So it's all about balance. So in this chronic inflammatory state, the body becomes adaptive, right? Um, we get immune modulation, which basically means that it's, since we're constantly being bombarded by an immune system stimulator, our immune system becomes overreactive, right? And we're seeing this a lot with autoimmune disorders, right? These, these all these syndromes we have, whether it be chronic fatigue or, you know, you name it, <clears throat> these syndromes, basically that underlying cause is that inflammatory response because if inflammation hijacks so to speak if it changes the way your immune system is modulating thing because it's always hypersensitive then you're basically going to have an outcome of being oversensitive and that's what we basically call autoimmunity right autoimmunity because we're not sure what it means or what's causing it but it's a, the body's attacking itself and it does attack itself because it's so hypersensitive, right? So now normal cells in the adjacent area of injury starts to get tissue breakdown. That tissue breakdown creates more inflammation. More inflammation becomes some chemical mediator, and it's like a wildfire that just continues to burn out of control, right? So that's, that's um, the interesting thing is the body will, will kind of do what it's influenced to do, right? So if you, if you switch that, you think, okay, what about exercise? Not necessarily just to inflammation, but our, our adaptability. If you wanted to run 10 miles, you wouldn't run 10 miles today and be good at it, but you'd work your way up to it. And what that means is the body has an ability to really adapt to its environment. Mm -hmm. The sad part of it is, is that means it can adapt to a not so good environment, right? Meaning right. it's just going into survival mode. And so that then, this is the, you know, long, long story short, <laughs> this is what I think most of our people think is normal, 
right? They've burned wildfire out of control for 30, 40 years. They get to the age of 50 and they're like, oh, this is a normal part of getting older. Not even close, right? This is a normal part of being burning out of control for <laughs> decades on end, but it's not normal aging, right? Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I think that's such a such a massive misconception in our society that it's normal to get this disease and that disease and it's normal that I mean it's just yeah right like and and but we're living it, uh, such a different life than than years ago and whatever so um do you have something to say about that before I ask you the next question you no, like I mean that, that's it but you know I always have to chime in with the, the fact that there's no incentive to change that mindset right so when you look at you know big pharma needs customers for life it needs people on you know three four or five medications all supports chronic disease man you know uh, basically treatment so to speak uh, but really what it is what it means is we're perpetuating the mindset right we've conditioned our patients to think oh that's normal that's what you know what happens i'm 50 and i'm on three meds and i can't walk up the stairs as much as possible right and so it becomes this more normal thought process so there's not a lot of education out there of saying no that's completely false you know you can be totally fit you know 50 and totally healthy and and when you look around the world right we even have countries you know around the world who, who are far less you know industrialized in first world but yet they got healthy older living people right why they're not on meds they're not on degenerate diets they're not on you know chronically inflamed uh situations so i would say that our, our while our lifestyle is fast-paced and stressful it doesn't necessarily have to be because I, I'm a firm believer that our body and mind can handle all this acceleration we've had if we were in a healthy state. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're not collectively as a, as a population. So it just goes to show it doesn't matter. If we dramatically slowed down everything, like got rid of phones tomorrow, not much would change because what we're doing to accelerate our death and destruction is still there. Our food supply and our lifestyle habits, right? right. Not so no. <laughs> no, I get it. <laughs> we have conversation. My partner, Ike, and I actually just had a conversation like a couple nights ago about like what would our what would the world look like if like right we didn't have phones and like what what that would change and that's a whole other event. But um, that's a whole other end. yeah, <laughs> and there, you know, there is a lot of physiological detriments to people being on their phones, and you know I'm sure you've covered it in different talks, mm -hmm. you know. Especially right before bed and you're getting all that overstimulation of the optic nerve etc but the point being is is it's we always have to look at chronicity and chronic disease as a collectiveness there's a collectiveness of daily habitual habits we're doing to ourselves and that's why I say we, it's diet and lifestyle which we're training our body to be in a dysfunctional state and so being that that's not our innate uh, rhythm, the body just tries to adapt. And how does it adapt? Well, it gets over immune system stimulation, it gets overproduction of histamine and, and cytokines and all the things that are inflammatory because that's how it needs to deal with it, right? Because right. so like, the, the body's gonna, gonna try to just get through the day. Right, right. survive, yeah, absolutely. Right. That's exactly right. So like, what are some of the main things that you see in your practice and just as society as a whole that are causing this chronic inflammation and this premature aging? Well, it's the food supply without a doubt. Because every, um, every four hours, somebody's, we're putting stuff in our mouth, right? And being that our internal structure, our gastrointestinal system is really, that's our interaction with the outside world. So our skin protects us from all sorts of things. But when we willingly put things down into our immune system, stimulating gastrointestinal system, right? It's the only open face, right? So we're open on the top and open on the bottom. And that's, a, that's our external world comes into direct contact with the inside of our body. That's why 70% of our immune system is on the gastrointestinal because it keeps us alive. But we continually, for every three, four, five hours, bombard our gastrointestinal system i.e the immune system with not good things right things that were just not not designed for you know and you know there's a lot of debate on diet which you know most of it quite honestly is just uh, idiotic a lot of the discussions we have because i think what i like to point out my patients i say look we're eating a diet now that has never been seen on the face of the earth and I think that's where you, the debate ends, right? So if you want to describe whether we were eating meat or cheese or whatever, blah, 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 all the, all the, all the arguments that happen from all the cults, the bottom line is, is we are eating a 
genetically modified, highly processed, highly pesticide, fake food supply for the majority of our diet. Mm -hmm. There's no way in hell you could ever have a healthy organism by doing that 40, 50 years. You know, uh, if you flipped it around and said, hmm, how could we systemically poison a society over a slow period of time? <laughs> that would be the model, right? That would exactly be the model. Well, let's just taint the food supply with garbage slowly over time and watch what happens. And that's really where we're at, right? So what, like, is, is this reversible, this chronic inflammation that's been a result of food sure. supply and choices? Sure. Like, so, so what do we do? Absolutely. And, and never give up. That's the cool thing is, right? Because look at chronic inflammation. It's an adaptive response to keep you alive, right? Because if, it was, if we didn't have this chronic inflammatory response, it would knock us out in our probably first or second decade of life. So this chronic inflammatory response has helped modulate, and even though it changes the modulators of the body, it helps perpetually keep us alive. Now the end game is, is when you start getting older, is it is one of the leading causes of premature death. So when we talk about premature aging, the, that definitely corresponds to premature death. And that's unfortunate because we shouldn't, honestly, we shouldn't be losing people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s years old. We really shouldn't. We're not, we're an animal that's not designed to, to, to cap out that fast, really. We should easily be living into our 80s, 90s, and even 100s, no problem. You know, that, I mean, when you look at, the, the, the way we're designed with our, our, our ability to heal, right, and then flourish, that should be our, our target. Now, the nice thing is, as you asked about healing, or can you reverse it? Absolutely, you can reverse it, right? And how do we know this? Because when we put patients on these protocols, they systemically change. Their body, which is an overmodulation of immune, immune system and inflammatory response, starts to recede. And why would that be? Well, you've removed the stimulus of, of why you're chronically inflamed. We know this from cigarette smokers, right? So smoke, people who quit smoking within a month, their lung tissue is much more functional, much more healthy, right? Then over five years, you do a follow-up, it's even more. In 10 years, it's like they never smoked at all after 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the body has an innate, miraculous ability to heal. Matter of fact, that's, in my opinion, that's what's got, gotten us to 2020. Because we've tried to kill ourselves throughout the last several centuries. <laughs> like people talk about climate change and global warming. Like, man, we got a lot of other things we've tried to kill ourselves with. So I think the point is, is as long as we can get on the right track, our body will heal. And it does. It really does. I mean, we have, you know, stage three and four cancer patients that are around cardiovascular, post-surgical or pre-surgical cardiovascular patients who resolve and miraculously return to a, a good state of health. And, you know, we call it miraculous, but that's how we're designed. We really are designed. So if we simply just turned it around and, and focused more on healing, it, it wouldn't be, um, it, we wouldn't have so much uh, death and disease. That, what's concerning, if there's anything that's really going to collapse us, more than likely it'll be our health care right? Because chronic disease is expensive. It's right. very expensive. This is another topic for a different show, I'm sure, but mm -hmm. it, it's very, very cost, um, costly to the health economic dollars. And then when you see what's out there as far as what are the treatments, it's chronic use of pharmaceuticals that then, you know, once the patient breaks down far enough, it's procedures. Right. Right. And then following procedures, guess what? They go on. More, More medicine. medicine. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, a brilliant financial picture for certain mm -hmm. industries but it's not for our population you know yeah. that's so like what what are some like i guess strategies like think action steps people could start taking on in their life right now to help decrease inflammation or reverse inflammation in their body okay so look at the let's let's discuss quickly the foods what are the foods that really promote uh this chronic inflammatory response and a lot of it has to do with um, you know, one is the SOS diet, which we're so famous for. The Western diet is sugar, oil, and salt, right? The SOS diet, um, oddly the mnemonic, right? But when you look at the standard American diet, I love that. What's, what's mm -hmm. the acronym for the standard American diet? Sad. Sad. Well, I mean, spot on. I mean, someone had to think that I mean, almost a joke for the government, right? What should we call this? Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, uh, but it's really, so it's high in inflammatory compounds. So, and here's the thing on meats and meats and cheese and animal tissue. So the, the you know, without getting any, you know, cultist type of arguments, 
<laughs> the what we know of the animal fats and animal proteins, they, they are stimulators of the inflammatory response. It's not whether or not you eat it sometimes, et cetera. It's just how we do things, right? Um, again, there's no one bad food. If you remove that one bad food, it's not going to, it's not going to fix everything, but it's, it's all in the, the, that uh, sequence of unfortunate events. So you look at the animal thing, we're eating animal proteins and animal fat, and you can't separate the two, right? They're together, right? And high cholesterol and arachidonic acid, which is one of the uh, inflammatory compounds found in animal tissues. We're eating it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then snacks. And then we're piling on highly refined sugar, oils, and salts on top of that. So we're really making a Molotov cocktail every meal, right? And so if we can reverse a lot of that, number one, the first thing you did is you quit the inflammatory response. So the first meal you stop shoving inflammatory compounds down, down into your gut, that's the first step to automate. You've already interrupted the chronic inflammatory response, right? Because a healthy meal, you know, full, of especially like dark leafy greens and, you know, you got the antioxidant, phytonutrient, high fiber foods, the aqueous based foods like melons and berries and all these foods, they extinguish uh, inflammation immediately. And number one, they don't stimulate inflammation. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. And so, you know, I've had people just, you know, go, go to whatever, go to a fast food joint and have a, have their whole meal. Right. And then by the time you're leaving, you feel like hell. And what, you know, what that feeling is, is that's the chronic inflammatory response. That's the inflammation going, you've just been poisoned. I got to get busy. And that's what happens, right? Whereas I've never had anybody eat a cup of broccoli, steamed broccoli with a steamed spinach and a bowl of berries and go, man, I feel like crap. Right. It, just doesn't, it just doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So why? The body gets what it needs, right? Those antioxidants, phytonutrients, and clean burning calories, right? Low calories, and doesn't have the in inflammatory stimulators, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's not to say that one food is bad or, what, or the other. It's really how we eat things. We just eat chronically um, heavily refined, processed, high animal food intake because that's what's pushed you know, that's what's pushed down our throat, you know, uh, and I see it all the time and, and the brainwashing occurs you know, very, very little. So, you know, drive down, we don't have the woods here in Hawaii, but if you drive down in the mainland, you drive down you'll see, you know, meth kills and it's some gnarly billboard and alcoholism destroys families and cocaine does this, right? And you're like, oh yeah, what a bummer, man. If you blah, blah, blah. Next one is like Arby's, Carl's Jr., McDonald's, <laughs> right? But to your body, your body doesn't care and your body doesn't play morality, which means, you know, if you did math, it's going to react in a violent way. And if you chronically were putting foods down you that are also very chronic inflammatory stimulating, your body's going to break down over time as well. You know, am I equating the two? Well, kind of, meaning the body, you know, is going to break down when it's, when it's inundated by highly processed toxic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. So getting back to it, Caloric value is another thing, and everybody's freaked out about calories. This is this is the whole diet industry thing. It's about calories, calories, calories. Calories don't have a lot of relevancy, in my opinion, if you're eating whole foods because they're not high caloric to begin with. Right. But what we do find is when we put patients on lower calorie, higher nutrient um, dietary protocols, they really, really do well, meaning the inflammatory response drops even faster. And so if you think about that we're a processor, we are, we're a food processor, the more efficient the foods we're eating is more efficient for our body, the less energy, right, the less work it takes to actually um, metabolize these things. So that's a very important part too. And that's why you'll see, you're probably seeing a lot more talk about intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. which I'm a big fan of, I think matically we're, we're a nomadic animal coming out of history, right? It's only recent again that we live in the same house and shop at, you know, supermarkets. Historically we're a nomadic animal, which means we're designed to fast. Yeah. You know, when you're, you know, hiking through the woods, you know, there's no drive through like, hey, let's pick up a, you know, double cheeseburger. So the intermittent fasting is, is a, a cleansing part of our diet. Now, I wouldn't just randomly do it. Obviously, seek out a good health practitioner and someone who's got the experience with intermittent fasting and, and, and utilize it and educate it. But again, what does it do? It dramatically drops the chronic inflammatory response with the intermittent fasting. Right? So 
these are these are the collective things that we could do you know as 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 uh, you know that what we do for our patients and what patients should be kind of searching out i think uh, uh, everybody's always so worried about eating it's it's we're, we're just the food addictions in our country is insane really because we're we're addicted to food no doubt about it oh yeah no is doubt. a quick question around like um C-reactive protein. When I, I, you know, back in the day when I was studying nutrition for my my degree years ago, that was the one of the main indicators of inflammation. Is that is that still true today, or what? Can you say anything about C-reactive protein? That's a like a blood test you can get everyone. Who's no, that's a good question. And so, with all my patients, they go through a battery of really comprehensive tests. And C-reactive protein and C-reactive protein high sensitivity are two very very good markers of systemic inflammation. And it's a marker that'll move very, very well when you put pe people on clean diets, right? Because again, it's an indicator of systemically what's going on in their body, right? And so when we move them to a cleaner diet, that C-reactive protein will just um, dramatically go down. And then we're talking a matter of weeks, right? So there was a great movie, it, it, the, um, the Game Changer. Okay. Right? I don't know if you saw that on Netflix, but the, the beauty of that movie talks about the blood labs where they were taking some some serum of people who were eating you know a, a dirty diet and a clean diet and you could see immediately the serum changes and the power in that is that's fine in a snapshot of doing it one time but remember standard american diet the western diet our, our population is eating that every three to four hours, right? So again, over a period of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you're talking about the systemic damage that is quite significant. Mm -hmm. So C-reactive protein is a real good one, but actually you get so much information out of a CBC, right? A complete blood count and a comp metabolic panel, um, hemoglobin A1C, which is a very, very good one for pre-diabetes and diabetes patients. Typically, your doctor will run glucose, but they need to run that hemoglobin A1C because that tells us over time how sticky your blood, uh, your red blood cells are with sugar. And so, uh, I think pre, you know, pre-diabetes is one of the biggest uh, pre-diabetes and diabetes is one of the big um, diseases that start to infiltrate. The other interesting thing is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Over 70 million Americans have it. Right? These are people who don't drink. So we've always associated alcoholism with cirrhosis, right? But we have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I also run a lot of ultrasounds on our patients. And if we need to, we'll do CT or MRI on, on the organs. And the, this fatty infiltrate that happens in the liver is coming from one place. And it's always people are like, I don't drink. And oh, that's, so alcohol isn't the only bummer for the liver. Processed foods, high fat diet, and chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so if you have fat, kind of infiltrates the pancreas and the liver, we're gonna get systemic dysfunction. And remember, once the organ becomes inflamed, the chronic inflammatory response has to deal with that, right? So you see pan pancreatitis before you see pancreatic cancer, right? You're gonna see liver inflammation, right? Before you see liver cancer. You're gonna see colitis or you know, you know, inflammation in the colon before you see colon cancer too. Right. So it's a fascinating thing. Inflammation has to be there first before you get an advanced progressive de destructive disease. And so that's that's a big part of what my job is in treating chronic progressive disease. We're going to pick all that up now. That's our goal. We want to pick that up in an itis before it turns into an adenoma, carcinoma, sorbine, right, et cetera. So uh, and really, honestly, this, most people are really inflamed. I mean, they really are. Um, most everybody has some sort of, there's a lot in the, you know, the comprehensive metabolic panel, like alkaline phosphatase is another very important. Um, LDH is another one. Looking at our liver enzymes, very important. And cholesterol. So while cholesterol is in, important, um, it's, you know, in, in uh, uh, you know, statins sell a lot of, you know, high cholesterol. That's the, that's the drug for, um, for high cholesterol, but the, what it says to me is we have we're having some chronic inflammation and liver issues when someone has elevated cholesterols. So not just randomly, and there are families that have a tendency to have high cholesterols. And again, without any inflammatory component, I'm not worried about someone's chronic uh, high cholesterol. It's really not that big of a deal. But typically, we don't see 
clean arteries and, and no inflammation with high cholesterol, we see it with everything else. So it's just another key, another part of the puzzle that tells us, ooh, this guy's breaking down or this gal's breaking down. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing too, I always have to remind, remember cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. And, we, and, and so diseases become, you know, they, they're like fashionable depending on what patented med is being pushed the hardest. Women still die of cardiovascular disease right? Number one killer of women. You know, well, cancer gets a lot of, you know, spotlight for females and, you know, collect collectively it should. Cardiovascular disease is still number one killer. So we always, we tend, we have a tendency to think of men dying of heart, heart cardiovascular, but women, same thing. And so the, how do you go about reversing it? Now I'm drop the chronic inflammation to get on the diet that promotes uh, antioxidant phytonutrients these kind of things that are not only anti-cancer but they're anti-heart attack as well right mm -hmm. yeah they tend to be good for for so many preventative things when you <laughs> when well, you and you know and this is the push so i mean if there really is one thing that's causing death and destruction of the human beings chronic inflammation right and chronic inflammation is going to come from an outside source and the beauty of that is you get to dictate how often do you want to you know slam the crap out of your body Right. Yeah. You really do. We we hold the key. No one for other than kids. Um, nobody forces you to eat the diet you're eating. Nobody. You have full control over whether you smoke, whether you drink, whether you eat, whether you exercise. These are the things that we have full control over. Right. And that those are the, the you know the the hard part is is the like anything. The further we get away from it, though, right? Because food food addiction, right? The dopamine response of the highly processed foods. It's engineered that way for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, when we, when you think of a lot of, you know, I have patients who we have brand arguments, right? Like cola wars. Think of the cola war, right? They, they actually argue like Coke or Pepsi, which one's better? Like, really? Really? Mm -hmm. That's interesting, but they do because there is the taste and the, and think of a, think of fast food. You can drive down the street and not see the actual fast food joint yet, but you can smell it. And you're like, oh, I know what that is. It's X, right? And so all that is engineered for one, reproducibility, and two, uh, loyalty, brand loyalty, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a funny thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just thinking of this advertisement that Ike and I saw the other night for a fast food establishment I will not name, but a new a new sandwich that was like, um, a bun with French fries in the middle, like topped with mayonnaise and ketchup. <laughs> I was like, wow, we've really gotten creative here, haven't we? <laughs> That's good. If you just deep fried that, and then you'd be on to something, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, no, I mean, that's it. Now, what, what are all those things do? Let's talk about yeah. from, from, the, from the, the taste factor. Those just, our tongue is basically the first, you know, our oral cavity is the first part of our GI system, which we forget. So your GI system starts at the mouth. And as soon as you put something on your, on your tongue, if it's really refined, heavily uh, oxidized, right, with the fried oils and all this stuff, and then the dopamine receptor in the brain, which is our instant gratification, gets a supercharge, right? Whereas if you, you know, you put a handful of blueberries in your mouth, it's like, ooh, this is really good, but you don't get like, woo. Right? right, you should. So the highly supercharged foods are all processed. Again, non-natural occurring. These do not occur in nature. So they've been just like meth or cocaine. Take cocaine for instance. Cocaine does not occur in nature. It comes from a plant, a relatively benign plant that if you just simply chewed on the leaves, not much would happen. But you have to treat it with like gasoline or hexane or any kind of heavy benzene chemical mm -hmm. to make it a highly toxic drug. That's what we've done with our food supply. We've treated it, chemicalized it, processed it into a highly, almost drug-like substance that as soon as it hits your tongue, it's captured your brain. Mm -hmm. And then the adaptive response of our addictions is the more you eat it, the more you need to get the same high. That's why overeating is easy in the United States. Now, I'll give you an example. So if someone's going to watch our, our, our awesome interview, Two people are going to sit down side by side. One person has a box of cookies in their lap. One person has a bunch of bananas, nine bananas. The cookie head is going to just go through the whole box over the hour interview, right? Mm -hmm. The person eating the bananas will eat one, maybe two bananas, right. maybe if they're really hungry. 
but there, I've never seen anybody demolish nine bananas. Right. Yeah. Why? And why is it? Well, the banana has everything your body needs, nutrient, fiber, some water in it, right? The antioxidants. And that is what your body ultimately is looking for. What does the cookie have in it? Not much of anything except highly refined, you know, sugar, flour, salt, right? These are the things that drive the dopamine. So the person eating the cookie is now driven by an addiction, whereas the banana person is just driven by, hey, I'm good, two bananas right. good, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to get back to because at the same time, cookie guy is now an inflammatory mess and feels like hell. And we always say it, right? Why the hell did I eat that whole right. box of cookies, right? What is that really, what is that equate to physiology is I'm inflamed, I feel poisoned, I, I gotta lay down. Right, and the banana person is like, yeah, no, I'm good. You know, mm -hmm. I think we'll go take a walk, and that's the difference, right? So we're we're talking about health benefits towards or toxicity, and that's really what what we do now. Again, cookie person, more than likely, three more hours from now, four more hours from now, it's going to do the same thing. Right, more. You know, going to go get the um, what you know, the hamburger with or the French yeah. fries with the you know ketchup <laughs> and mustard. So you know, that's the thing, and then over and over and over and over, your body just you know, has to go into a, basically an adaptive, like, okay, well, if inflammation is the way we're going to do it, then that's what I'm going to have on at all times, right? right. Awesome. And that's how we get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. That's awesome. And thank you for, you know, sharing, sharing things in ways that people can, you know, start making changes today if they're inspired and, um, you know, moving, moving down that pathway. So are, are there any last insights, anything else that yeah, I feel right. like so how about the 10... Top, 10 top anti-aging tips, all right? I'll give you this. And so basically, here's someone. We want to avoid the processed foods as much as we can, right? Minimize them. Now, the caveat is that is when you do eat them, they're addictive. So it's mm -hmm. going to take some willpower to go through that. Uh, but these are the saturated fats, sugars, you know, refined carbohydrates, right? Um, total, you know, that, that, that's the refined SOS diet, sugar, oil, and salts, okay? The second thing to help create, to help really whack out inflammation and food addictions at the same time is eat whole foods, right? Whole, particularly plant-based foods where the antioxidant phytonutrients are. And these are our whole grains, our legumes, fruits, vegetables vegetables, right? You can steam them, you can saute them. There's all sorts of different ways to get these kind of foods. Lots of cruciferous because they're anti-cancer. But again, remember, if they're anti-cancer, it means they're anti-inflammatory as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, and berries. Remember berries, organic berries, because they are heavily sprayed if they're inorganic. But they're for pound for pound, berries are the highest antioxidant foods we have in our food supply. So just a cup of berries a day would be enormously helpful for uh, inflammatory response. Second thing, you want to try to maintain a healthy BMI. And I'm not, I don't put a lot of stock in BMI because you got foot, you know, football players are all over BMI, right? Mm -hmm. So a linebacker, six, two, two, 50, 2% fat, but he's BMI. Right, exactly. <laughs> BMI is whack. Well, so don't pay too much attention to it more than get out and do something. Right. And here's the thing walking so we push people into gyms and things like that i think it's a i think that's a not a good thing unless you love gyms most people who don't exercise don't like to exercise it's not that they don't have time it's they don't so i think walking is one of the best things to start getting out and do it and you can do it around your your house you can do it at work 10 minutes 15 minutes just take a walk i mean think about the society we live in now you get in the car to go drive through to get food to, you know, we don't even get out of the car anymore. Yes. So, simple walking. And that's why you see people in, you know, New York and in, in Europe, since I was just in Europe for a month, I mean, people walk everywhere. Right. And so there's that metabolic activity. So that's something that's someone don't make it overly complicated. Um, second thing, smoke, um, you know, obviously smoking again, in the United States, we've got less smokers than we did. But still, smoking is carbon monoxide inhaling, and it, it you know really does a job on our body. Um, let's see, add some things. I just got on my list here that we don't really see. So uh, seeds and nuts are good, but not don't overdo it. Um, you know, you could about a tablespoon of seeds, quarter cup of nuts a day is good. Uh, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, almonds, all these kind of things. Um, remember though, if you're you, you, and this is what I tell people who are overweight trying to lose weight. Don't swap nuts for peanuts. I mean, excuse me, chips and stuff. So what I found in, you know, I kind of had, we had, we had to curb our, our, 
our uh, instruction to patients was like, okay, so just just make some nuts. And I found these people were eating like a half pound of nuts a day. Oh yeah. Woo. So mm -hmm. you know, while they're better than the chips, you still want to you know modify. Remember, these are rich fat sources, and they're good fats. But still, fat is fat. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. So if you're trying to lose weight, limit limit the the nuts and go more with the fresh fruits and veggies and things like that, right? Um, let's see, what else we got? Spices, herbs and spices, very good for medicinal. Remember, centuries, for centuries, we've used herbs and spices medicinally as well as culinary taste. So, you know, from garlic to onions to um, oregano and thyme and all the type of uh, herbs and spices we use, black pepper, ginger, right? That's a biggie, right? And that we talk about now and curry and basils and curcumin and all this kind of stuff. So basically it comes back to that whole food diet. If we're, instead of using packets of, you know, some high sodium flavorings, artificial flavorings, we simply get back to simple flavorings using herbs and spices. We get the medicinal quality and the, and the taste, right? Which is very, very important. And then sleep. Sleep's an important one. It really is. So um, try to disengage. Go back to reading a book. I think they still print books. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the problem with is, you know, we alluded to briefly was the light, right? The light of our supercharged devices overstimulate the brain. Now you're going to try to sleep. So try to get away from that a couple hours before we're talking, you know, a lot of the, the journals are talking about two hours before sleep, just unplug devices and, and sleep um, will, will help. And then stress management, stress management to me, you know, if people like, uh, meditation and things, that's great. But a lot of people won't go there, particularly in our society. But I also have to remind them, look, your toxic diet is stressful. You not taking a walk is stressful, meaning it's added stress to the body that we haven't discharged. So you're, you know, especially at work, we're getting stressed, you know, can't stand this guy, that guy has a lot of this, deadlines. The point being is, is you're manifesting stress in the body and you're holding on to it. Then you're eating foods that accelerate these highly toxic Addictive foods accelerate stress. They're the fight flight response. So they drive us into fight flight. So without having to get too, you know, too life changing, just simple things. Changing the diet, number one, is huge. By no longer eating these highly toxic dopamine stimulating, you've already reduced stress. Two, you'll reduce the chronic inflammation because chronic inflammation is stressful on the body. Right. And we know that, right? Think of the, the sprained wrist. If you just sprain your wrist, you think how bummed out you are for weeks. Like, ah, I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, imagine what's going on internally on a cellular thing. You're chronically stressed. You're chronically inflamed, right? And then the other thing too is, you know, if you like, start doing some things. I think unplug. When I get away from the TV, get away from the freaking Instagram stuff and get away. <laughs> do it for a short period of time. But yeah. now we're obsessed with it, right? You know, you're walking down the street and someone collides into you, you find they're on their phone. What was on your phone that was so important when you had to crash into me, right? So these are the kind of things. Get back to living life, in my opinion, right? So do things. Non-plugged in things, right? Mm -hmm. Just simple stuff. That's a lot of it. And then the biggie is hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Why do I push water so much? We have a dehydrated food supply. All the toxic foods we eat are all dehydrated. They're without water. So um, to refine foods means removal of water. So mm -hmm. hydrate, lots of water. Your water is an ant active transport system, meaning it needs water to move everything around. The more inflammation you have, the more water you need, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a biggie, water, water, water. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. 10, 10 anti-aging, healthy aging tips. I love it. Thank you so much. And that's good. I tried to hit a few. So yeah. And you know, there's, um, I have a book, my book's coming out. It's, it has a lot to do with chronic inflammation. It really is. It's about resolving chronic inflammation and the chronic disease process. It's called the healing protocols. So that'll be out shortly. Actually, I'm not, when does this air? Is this live? This is uh, late February, early, early March. So. Okay. There you go. So it'll be out. And uh, people can look at it there. And then my website is, you know, docemerson.com. Um, but, you know, we have a different kind of practice, but it's all. <laughs> we uh, like it. We like it. And we'll, we'll link to your book too. So um, is it a uh, pre-order right now or is no, it? No, not pre-order. Okay. It'll, it'll just launch and launch. And it'll be on Amazon and iTunes and all that other good stuff. Um, but um, yeah. And, I, you know, I think, I think for most people, particularly what you do, you know, keep, keep, 
fill in your head with good knowledge. Keep looking, keep, keep reading, keep educating yourself towards, you know, getting, getting healthier, right? Don't Dr. Google things. So I got to throw that out. Don't Dr. Google things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a lot of people who, you know, come up with saying, they call me and they're like, oh, doc, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm reading this, blah, blah, blah. I think I got bits, bit by a titsy fly. I'm like, were you in Africa last week? <laughs> right. Okay, it's not a titsy fly. I'm going to tell you that. So uh -huh. be careful because what happens is, remember, what we entertain in our brain manifests in our body. So if we're constantly Googling things without a body of knowledge, we're going to create more stress than it's really need. Like you wouldn't Google how to fly a triple seven, you know, jetliner and, and then go, Hey, I'm qualified. Yeah. Do the same thing. With that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can read a little bit, but don't get, don't get too crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just continue to look at good, solid, reputable things that, you know, I think see, hearing more speakers is always good. Uh, some, um, you know, I, I think points of view are, 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 are healthy. As we get more points of view on things, we can then kind of make a rational decision. Of, you know what, that works for me. And eh, that one doesn't, you know, so that's good. But part of that, the, the, the moral of that story is education. As you continue to get more education on things, um, I think it's, it just grows you as a human being. Mm, I I agree. <laughs> awesome. Sure. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. I appreciate you and your work and and for giving us so many so many things to work with today. So I appreciate you. I hope it helped. <laughs> I think it did. Absolutely. And right, thank you everyone who's watching or listening right now for showing up for yourself, for being open to learning and educating and and we'll see you again real soon. Take care.